Check, check. All right. Welcome, Rotarians and guests, to the Rotary Club of York. It is a great day to be a Rotarian, for sure. And it's a great day to be a Rotarian because we live according to the service above self motto, and we follow the four-way test. If you would so kindly join me in reciting the four-way test now. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? And will it be beneficial to all concerned? Oh, my, yes. And quite frankly, every day is a great day to be a Rotarian when you live out the four-way test because it makes life's decisions a lot simpler while improving the quality of life and the lives of those around you. And that's why I like reciting it as often as we do. And I am your president, Aaron Jacobs, and I hope to serve each of you by the virtues of the four-way test. Now we're all excited about the program today. We've got popcorn, but before we do that, we're going to enjoy the opening song, God Bless America and the Pledge by Steve Feldman, followed by the invocation by past president Jackie Summers and visitor introductions by Lori Broadbeck. Steve. Oh, please join me. God bless America. Land that I love, stand beside her and guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies to the oceans white with gold. God bless America. My home, sweet home. God bless America, my home, sweet home. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible with liberty and justice for all. Good afternoon, please join me in a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this day and for the opportunity to gather in fellowship and friendship. Please bless our time together and guide us in our endeavors to serve our community. We pray for wisdom to make a positive impact in our world. May our efforts inspire and encourage future generations. Thank you for our speaker and the opportunity to learn his story of courage and giving up a tenured career to pursue his dream of building a business in the community he loves, and for his passion for hard work, giving back, and making a difference. As we consider the beginning of Rotary Foundation Month, we pray for guidance and strength in conducting the work before us. May we strive for excellence, and may it serve as a catalyst to move us forward. Please bless this food and those who have prepared and served it, into your wisdom we place our path and direction. Amen. Hello, everyone. Uh, I am pleased to have the honor of introducing our guest for today's meeting. Uh, if uh, when I call your name, please stand until President Aaron has welcomed you. We only have one guest this morning. Uh, and that is Nathaniel DeMemo, a guest of Tom Caltagarone. Thanks, Lori. Tom, I don't always envy you. Caltagarone. I had I had the privilege of having lunch one time with Tom, and he drilled that into me so articulately. Is this your first time visiting our club? Yeah. Oh, so here, I'm going to do the math for you. This is how it works. Welcome. So basically it goes like this. If you come to the club for the first time, welcome. If you come to the club a second time, welcome back. If you come back a third time, Tom, bring him back a third time. You got to think about becoming a Rotarian. And by saying that, it's time for us as Rotarians to make him feel very welcome with a round of applause. Thank you. Now, next slide. Here's a nice little Rotarian non sequitur moment. In the spirit of Halloween, we have a yabba dabba doozy. 
Can anyone guess who this might be behind the blue smiley face? Say it loud, say it proud. Doug who? Doug Berman, yes, our very own Yabba Dabba Doug. Doug, I will leave it up to you as to whether or not putting this picture on Facebook was a Yabba Dabba Do or a Yabba Dabba Don't. All right, on to the real announcements. Thanks for being a good sport, Doug. I'm also not supposed to tell you that Glenn told us to do that because he didn't want me to embarrass him in front of everybody. So I didn't say anything about that. All right, so on the less fun stuff. No, this is fun stuff. The Legacy Committee will meet today in the mixed grill downstairs immediately following our club meeting. The nominating committee meets on November 6, 11 a.m. via Zoom. The Preserve Planet Earth Committee, whom we will hear from in a few moments, will meet on November 8th at 8 a.m. via Zoom. The Program Committee will meet on November 8th as well at 1.20 after our normal program here at CCY, and past president Mike Summers is looking for suggestions for programs and speakers for next year. So please send any suggestions you have to him for by November 6th to be considered a program for our club. On to our next announcement. We're having an extension. What? They meet when I say they meet. I would remind you at this point, I'm only one third through my year. We've got a long way to go. 8 a.m. Thank you, past president Al. On to the next slide. Do we have one for idea committee? There we go. Nope, that ain't it. So back it up for a second. So the idea committee, as you know, was doing a toy drive that we ended last week. Well, here's the thing. We did really well, but we didn't quite meet the goal that we wanted. We did about $700 and we want to hit $1,000. So here's the deal. Here's the challenge. My challenge to this club in the next week is to try to get that stretch goal of an additional $300 to the idea committee and youth development committee. Uh, to do that, and I will match from the president's fund dollar for dollar that every Rotarian donates this week until Friday. So please, let's help him get to that goal, okay? Also, next week is our meeting for the annual Veterans Day meeting. And you've been here before, you know how that goes. We invite all of our members of the club who are veterans to gather at 1145 next week for a group photo and our annual Parade of Veterans. It is a long-standing tradition of this club, and it's one that I'm very fond of. My last announcement, you may have noticed that uh, Ken Cooper provided a video slide at the beginning during lunch of the Ride for Polio. Uh, it turns out we raised $2,050 from that event. Thank you, Al Sykes, and those who supported the Ride for Polio. Good job. Having said that, I'd like to invite Lynn to the podium to give us a conference update. Lynn. Look at that cute picture. Did you guys miss us last week? Thank you. So uh, last week, uh, Courtney, president-elect and president-elect nominee Wilda and I got to travel to Baton Rouge, Louisiana for the annual large club conference. And this is a gathering of clubs that have at least 275 members and a paid staff person. There were 53 clubs from all across the country and Canada represented, uh, as probably as many people as in this room. So we got to experience all things Rotarian while we were there. We had a really good time. The food was great. Uh, we learned a lot and uh, we had a great chance to talk to a bunch of other Rotarians similar to us. We have to look kind of far away to find other Rotarians with clubs as big as ours. So it was a great chance to talk with each other about how are things going in your club? What are you seeing? What are the trends? And to learn from each other. We learned one thing about our club. Um, comparatively, we're really thriving. A lot of clubs, large clubs are still struggling and coming out of COVID and they're still trying to face the uh, way to bring up their membership and get their members a little bit more engaged. So we're doing okay. We also learned that clubs tend to have similar challenges to what we're looking at. Uh, we had a lot of talk about improving member engagement 
And many clubs are looking for ways to make a greater service impact in their community, similar to how we're doing it. Large clubs, including ours, are looking ahead at how Rotary is going to look in the future. How do we grow and change and retool our club to meet member needs and expectation for today's Rotarians and tomorrow's Rotarians? How do we better serve the needs of our community? And how are we going to help Rotary thrive as we go into the future? I also learned that Courtney and Wilda know how to have a good time. Please ask Courtney about the alligator that she wrestled. Uh, and if today's dessert challenge is any indication, Courtney, your Courtney's year is going to be fun too. Thanks. Next week's program will be Courtney wrestling an alligator. Here's what Lynn didn't tell you. I want to put a little bit of perspective to what she says. This is large club conference. We have the benefit and blessing of being one of the largest rotary clubs in the entire world. We know that uh, we don't need to tout that very often. But to be invited to these kinds of conferences is amazing in the fact that when you go, these other large clubs are from cities that you recognize. Uh, Baton Rouge, Cincinnati, uh, San Jose, big cities. And when you go there and they say, well, where are you from? And you say, York. And they go, oh, New York? No, York. Where is that? I say that to you because our club is an unbelievable anomaly, not only in our community, but worldwide. And we and like and as Lynn said, we are leading the way for others Rotarians to do. We are leaders, period. And that is also true on the global scale, which leads me to my next point about the president's challenge. And we are at this point where we're going to invite Jane to the stage to talk about her committee to inform you, promote the committee, solicit new members to the committee and gain new ideas. And here's my challenge. I've said it a million times. I'm going to say it again. I challenge each committee to bring at least one new member to their committee. And I challenge the committees to create at least one new project or attract new members. And I challenge you members to join a new committee, or in some cases, maybe two committees. And at the very least, I challenge each of you to understand what it is that our club does in service and also what we're capable of. And so it's my privilege to invite Jane to the stage to talk about Global Projects Committee. Thank you, President Aaron. Well, whatever Rotary may mean to us, to the world, it will be known by the results it achieves. Paul Harris said that to remind Rotarians that our mission is around the globe. For over 100 years, York Rotary Club members have donated their skills, exper expertise, and their finances to support our local community, but also to international projects around the world. There are four, six areas of interest th that the Rotary Foundation supports. One is, is promoting peace, fighting disease, providing clean water, sanitation, and hygiene, addressing needs of mothers and children, supporting education, growing local economies and protecting the environment. Our Global Grants Committee is charged with identifying projects in developing countries, building relationships with Rotary Clubs around the world, raising funds to complete the projects, and monitoring the project to ensure results are achieved. Any of you can bring a project idea to the Global Grants Committee. Maybe you have a relationship with a humanitarian organization or you volunteered in another country. Please let us know, we'd love to hear those ideas. Sometimes we have also lent our global grant support to other clubs that are doing projects in it throughout the world, like the teacher training program in Honduras or the bus to safely transport Liberian children to school. Most global grant projects are about $30,000 or more. The Rotary Club of York typically budgets about $3,000 a year to support global projects, but we can also use the Rotary Foundation Special Projects Fund as needed. But we really seek to leverage our dollars with matching dollars from the Rotary, Found Rotary Foundation, the District Grants Program, and as well as other clubs and sponsors. Our club is now advancing, as you've heard, a global sanitation project in Sandafi, Ethiopia, to build latrines in a community where fewer than 50% of the residents have access to a toilet. But for the past year and a half, our committee has met virtually with our partners in Ethiopia to develop the project, define roles, and build relationships with the Rotary Club in Addis Ababa, who's our partner in the project. We then went about raising money for the project from you all. Thank you so much. We've also raised money from other district clubs. Seven have participated. 
The district matching has also agreed to match our dollars that we have raised. So the next step was we submitted a grant application to the Rotary Foundation. Of course, your contributions to the Rotary Foundation can help support this project through your gift to the Rotary Foundation. We are in the process of waiting for approval for that, that grant. These projects are complicated. Uh, they take a long time. You're dealing with a country that hasn't has as many resources as we have, but they are really rewarding. It's been a real joy to meet with via Zoom with our partners in Ethiopia, get to hear about their families, learn about the work that they're doing, and also be inspired that by their commitment to improve their communities. To be a Global Grants Committee member, you don't need to know about grant making. Uh, the committee members guide our project using their project management skills, their fundraising skills, and above all, patience. Yeah. Members ask thoughtful questions, they write appeal letters, they make presentations to other clubs, and they ask all of you to contribute to the project. The committee meets as needed. We typically meet at 7.30 in the morning via Zoom with our partners in Ethiopia. They're nine hours ahead of us, so that's why we start so early in the day. So you can always feel free to reach out to me or any of our club our committee members. Would you stand if you're a Global Grants Committee member? If you're here today, I know Steve Feldman's here, great. Andy Siebold and Elliot, um, thank you so much, Tom. So we really appreciate their support and contributions. They've had a lot of experience. So if you'd like to learn more about new cultures, if you like being inspired by the resilience of people living with much less than the average American, and if you like to feel grateful about the opportunity that Rotary offers to do good in the world, please join us. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. You know, I would confess that uh, the work that Jane's committee does happens quite independent and exclusive from me being president. And yet I'm very proud to say that what's happening is happening during my presidential year. And that is because we have such a great and focused committee under Jane's leadership. I do hope you consider joining that. But uh, again, we're very proud of you and thank you for all you're doing with Global Grants. Another round of applause. So now that we know what we're doing across the globe, I think it's now a good time to hear about what we're doing right here in York City with an update from Joe Stein. Joe. Thank you. Just to be clear, we meet at 8 a.m. because Al says so. Sorry, Aaron. Um, <laughs> so I, um, our update today is, is just a couple of quick things. Um, Last month, we did have our tree planting. It was scheduled to be October 13th. Um, we pivoted because of the cold and rain that was scheduled that day. And Al Sykes uh, led a team on Friday uh, to get all those trees installed. So, uh, Al, thank you for that. Uh, Al really takes the lead on planning those or finding those locations, securing permission. And then Brian Mummert helps uh, secure those um, the trees themselves. And then we have a great team. So thank you to everyone that helped that day, wanted to help or has helped in the past. Uh, you know, please a round of applause for all those folks. Speaking of Al, um, he's really passionate about um, the preserved planet Earth. And so he took the lead on preparing a comprehensive recycling list. And so we'll you'll see that in the upcoming weeks. We're just going to do a, a quick little circulation of it amongst our committee. And it really tries to capitalize on, uh, on anything you can imagine that you have in your house that you want to toss away, what you do with it in an appropriate manner. So uh, members of the committee helped Al formulate this list. We're going to take one last look at it and then circulate it to you all so that you have a resource available to you that if you ever have something in your household and you go, hey, what do I do with this? Um, hopefully there's an answer for you. And if, if the list doesn't cover it, really don't just throw it in your trash. Um, some of that stuff could be really hazardous, such as uh, rechargeable batteries, you know, those things explode. So we really want to make sure that people are disposing materials in an appropriate way. If our list doesn't cover it, you can go to your county solid waste authority. If they don't have it, just Google it and you'll likely be able to find something. Um, the last thing about recycling is the CRDC update. I just did want to stress again that we are no longer having collections here at the club. We will continue to offer uh, the plastic bags for the foreseeable future. The challenge there was they wanted to start charging us for a pickup. And so with the collection points throughout the city and the CRDC location, we felt there's enough opportunities for members to take their uh, recyclables to those locations. So we appreciate your ongoing efforts with that. And uh, that's all for today. Thank you, President Aaron. Thank you, Joe. And here's what Joe didn't tell you. 
If you can, in your mind's eye, imagine what 67 metric tons of plastic trash looks like. You got a picture in your head? Yeah, I don't either, but I can tell you it's a lot. That's how much that Bags of Build program that we participate in has gathered countywide. I suspect that our Rotary Club is responsible for at least 25 to 30% of that number. That's the impact that you and this club are having on our, commu our community and its environment by participating in that program. Please keep up the good work. Thank you, Joe. And who should be to my right but President-elect Courtney. So you may have noticed this morning that today's process of earning a dessert, you can thank President-elect Courtney for this as the opportunity to enhance your knowledge and expand your waste. So I don't know if she's coming up here to talk about your trivia, to wrestle alligators, or to do a communication committee update. Courtney, I leave it to you. Courtney. All of the above. You guys can bring in the alligator now. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All right, so if you arrived before noon today, you may have noticed your dessert was being held hostage in the back of the room until you answered a trivia question. So thank you for everybody that participated. The point of this was to help educate members um, on the York Rotary Foundation's recent rebranding, um, the York Rotary Foundation. So in the spirit of that, we're gonna go through six questions together. I'm gonna read the question. If you know the answer to the question, just shout it out after I'm done reading the question and your prize is another dessert. So let's get started. All right, true or false? The York Rotary Foundation is not a 5013C. False, that's correct. Next one. True or false? Your contributions to the York Rotary Foundation are tax deduct deductible. True. True or false? We do not care if you call the York Rotary Foundation the charitable endowment fund. False. We do care. Please don't call it the Charitable Endowment Fund. We rebranded by the York Rotary Foundation. This is our logo on the bottom right here. So you might have heard us being called CEF or Charitable Endowment Fund before, but it's now York Rotary Foundation. True or false? The York Rotary Foundation is the same as the Rotary Foundation. False. The Rotary Foundation is Rotary International's organization, and the York Rotary Foundation is the charitable arm of our club. Multiple choice. The name of the foundation is the Charitable Endowment Fund, the Rotary Club of York Do Good Fund, the Rotary Foundation, or D, Rotary Club of York. Correct. C, the York Rotary Foundation. You can also, uh, you might also hear us refer to ourselves as YERF. Um, rhymes with Smurf, so if you can't ever remember it, remember Smurf, um, and that's how you'll remember YERF, York Rotary Foundation. Last one, true or false. The York Rotary Foundation is directed by local decision makers to support local causes. True. The giving is directed by us to help our local community. So thank you guys for playing along today. Again, the point was just to help enhance the knowledge of our members around the York Rotary Foundation now that we've rebranded. So thank you. Thank you, President-elect Courtney, for making that fun. And now to introduce the program is me. Me, yes, popcorn. Yummy, delicious popcorn. I've made enough popcorn enough in my life to know with confidence that popcorn to me is easy. I don't know if you agree with me or not, Cody, but that's my opinion. I wish I could say the same about life. And perhaps our speaker today will agree with that. But life is constantly confronting and solving challenges as they are presented so that you come out the other side with more wisdom and stronger. And I believe that is the journey that Cody Shoemaker would like to share with us today. Cody and Eliana Shoemaker are the owners of the Popcorn Loft and have four children, Cole, Cade, Avery, and Alina. Cody was raised right here in Dover, while Eliana grew up in Sao Paulo, Brazil. As a matter of fact, they took their business over in 2021, middle of the pandemic, which is based right here in York County. Some of you know the Popcorn Loft. Both Cody and Eliana are active in the Church of Jesus Christ and the Latter-day Saints, where Eliana volunteers with the women's organization, and Cody helps with the Sunday school. Cody has been a member of the York North Rotary Club for a year now, and he delights in sharing his message of struggle, perseverance, and of course, success. Rotarians, please help me in welcoming our speaker, Cody Shoemaker. Hey, 
Right. Good afternoon. Uh, can everybody hear me okay? Very good. So like I said, my name is Cody Shoemaker. I, um, my wife and I, we purchased our business in October of 2021. And then, like he said, I grew up here in Dover. I went to Dover High School. Um, and then my wife is from Brazil. I met her when I did a mission trip down there, which I'll talk about briefly. Um, but we got married. It was uh, 2011, so we've been married for almost 12 years. Uh, we have two boys, two girls. And actually, I met Dave. Dave, where are you at? I know where you are here. Right there. So Dave Hoffman's uh, son, uh, Jonathan, is the principal uh, for our kids. So our, our girls are in kindergarten first now. So his son is the principal at Wallace in West York. And then my old, my middle son, Cade, uh, had Jonathan when we first moved here. My oldest son never went to Wallace, but my oldest son is now with his daughter-in-law because she works at Trimmer Elementary in West York. And so uh, pretty fun fact when he came in and told me that. But so our mission for the Popcorn Loft, so kind of, you know, how we got to where we got to um, was through a lot of failures and struggles and trials, right? There's a quote by a gentleman named Dieter Uchtdorf, and it says, it is your reaction to adversity, not the adversity itself, that determines how your life story will develop, right? And my story, my life is a lot of failures, right? So I grew up here in Dover. Um, and after high school, I wanted to go to, to college. And the girl I was dating in high school, she wanted to go to Michigan State. And so I had lived in Michigan periodically in middle school with my family. So I was like, oh, it'd be probably a good place to go back to school. Um, I was not good enough to get into a university, right? And so I knew I was like, oh, I'm going to community college and go down that route. So I flew out to Michigan on a Friday afternoon to uh, take the, uh, on a, uh, sorry, on a, a Friday morning to take uh, the uh, entrance exam to college on Friday afternoon. And then I had a flight back on Sunday morning. This was before you can do it online. You can do things now the way to do it. So I flew out there um, on Friday, went and took the exam and I failed it, right? So I failed the entrance exam to community college, which is unprecedented. Most people don't ever do that, right? Um, and so I asked the, I asked the lady two questions. My first question was, what did I fail on? And the second one was, when can I retake it? And, uh, cause I knew I had to fly home on Sunday. And so this was part of my senior year of school. And, uh, she said, you failed the English, English portion of it. Um, and you can retake it tomorrow. We're, we're open until noon. You just can't take it twice in the same day. So that Friday afternoon, I called my mom and I told her I failed. She thought I was joking. Um, obviously I wasn't joking. And I said, that's all right. Don't worry about it. I'm going to take it tomorrow morning and we'll be all right. So I said my prayers Friday night, restudied. Um, and then Saturday I, I passed, right? So I went and did a year. So I went out there and did a year of college. And then after my uh, first year of college, I, um, let's see, I had the chance to go to Brazil, hands down the best decision I ever made the best experience I've ever had. Um, so growing up as Latter-day Saint, you have the chance to go serve a mission for, for uh, young men. It's two years. For girls, it's a year and a half. And you don't get to choose where you go, right? And so God with the church, kind of the church leaders choose where you go and where they have a need. And I was blessed enough to get called to Sao Paulo, Brazil. And so I thought it was kind of ironic because I failed the English portion of my entrance exam to community college. And now I'm asked to go learn a completely different language um, in a country that I've never been to. And so, uh, so I went down to Brazil. And, um, and I served two years down there and became fluent in the Portuguese language and had the chance to meet and be impacted by tons and tons of people. Um, a benefactor of it, obviously, which you don't go on a mission to find a spouse. I was lucky enough. I, I met my wife down there in a year and a half after I came home. I was able to convince her to come up here um, and marry me. And so I did that. And then when I came home after my two-year mission, uh, I wanted to transfer to the university. The reason I wanted to transfer because you didn't have to do an entrance exam. You could just transfer your credits. And so I went and uh, got my got my bachelor's degree at Northwood University in business management and marketing. Um, and I did that. And now it was a by this time I was married. I we started having kids. And so my my college route was a little different than most people's because I didn't study full time. I worked full time during the day and then I studied in the evening. So I had classes from six o'clock to 10 o'clock every night. Um, so I would work from eight to five during the day. As soon as I was done working, I'd go take my classes till, uh, till 10 o'clock. And then I knew I wanted to be an athletic director. That's what I was going to college for. I wanted to be a collegiate athletic director. I you know, did sports growing up and I knew I wasn't good enough to compete in college, but I, I had a passion for sports. And so 
what I did was I decided, well, to do that, I need to get a master's pro a master's degree. So I had this bright idea that I needed to get a to get a master's. Uh, didn't go the way I thought. So I uh, I went and, and um, tried to take the GMAT, which I, I took the GMAT. I tried to pass it. I did not. Um, if you know anything about the GMAT, the GMAT is the entrance exam to a master's program at most big universities. Uh, my first one. Um, so give me an idea. If I scored anywhere over a 660, the director of Michigan State said I was going to get a, a scholarship um, to do a master's degree there. So first uh, practice exam I ever took, got a 580s to get a baseline of where I needed to be. Uh, my wife, I ended up quitting my full time job at the radio station. We saved up money. I quit my job so I could study, you know, for multiple months on end because school doesn't come easy to me. And my wife, actually, we had our son, our oldest son, Cole, was five months at the time. So she decided, well, I'm going to go to Brazil, spend you know a couple months down there with my family while you can just and you can just study. So I, I studied for three months. And by my last exam, I was at a 670 and I was I was on top of the world that Monday. So that Monday, I took the exam, the practice one got 670. I'm doing just fine. Thursday, I directly remember I was saying a prayer on Thursday night, asking for help for Friday. And he got a very clear answer on that said, you're going to be just fine, right? I took that as meaning you're going to be just fine. You're going to, you're going to pass. Everything's going to go great. Um, looking back, it was God's way of saying, you're going to be fine. You're going to bomb this and you're going to think your world's falling apart, but I'll help you put the pieces back together. Um, and so when I got, when I took the actual exam, I, uh, as you can see, I got a 570. So it didn't go the way I was thinking, the way I was hoping, um, but I firmly believe whenever you hit any kind of barrier in life, any kind of obstacle, there's two things you can do, right? You can quit and give up and mope and pout about it, or you can find another solution. And so I, um, so I started looking for different solutions, found different paths, and um, was able to eventually actually did get uh, into Michigan State, into the master's program. And I was able to graduate with a master's degree from Michigan State. And then that led me to... Um, a very, very fun and great opportunity. So I got a chance to get hired on by the University of Missouri um, to be their director of operations for the wrestling program. And if anybody knows much about collegiate wrestling, um, Penn State has now, Penn State has the best program in the country. And they've had it for over a decade. That used to not be the case. It used to be Iowa and Ohio State, some other universities. Um, I had never heard of Missouri, quite frankly. Um, but what happened was, is the coaches at Michigan State came to me and said, hey, there's an opportunity down there. Uh, we know you want a full-time position in this. We think you should take it. So I got the chance to go to Missouri and was extremely blessed. While I was down there, had the chance to go to the Olympics, had a chance to work with a couple of national champions, all Americans. Um, and every year we were there, we, we never, um, we never lost our conference. And the last year we were there, we were undefeated. And so I thought, okay, everything's going great, right? My career's taken off. I'm getting experience. I need everything is going wonderful. And life for me is a pattern, right? When you, when you hit the valleys, eventually you're going to come to the mountaintops. And after that mountaintop might be another valley. Um, and that's what it was for us. Right? And so my oldest son, Cole, when he was three years old, he was diagnosed with a disease. Um, it took a couple months to diagnose him because he got really, really sick um, at three years old. And we spent many weeks in the hospital, uh, many operations, procedures, and ambulance rides. And so after weeks of living in children's hospitals, um, if you ever think life is hard, right, find a children's hospital and go visit it. And you're going to realize pretty quick, life is not that hard, right? It's one of the most humbling experiences you can ever go to. Because even my son who was there, there were so many kids who were in what, much worse situations than he was. Um, and so my son taught me, you know, through that experience. And then this day, he's 10 years old. Um, he still does treatments and procedures on a biweekly basis. But um, he, he taught me that when life's hard, just look up, right? Look up. You know, you look up, you're going to see the sun, you're going to see who's in control of everything. And when you look down, you have no vision, right? And so if you look up, that's, you can have a vision. So, uh, so we were there and then I had this idea of my, I was talking to my boss at, at Missouri and he told me, he said, Hey, three years, you were in a male sport, indoor sport. We've had a lot of success. You've learned this aspect of college athletics. If you want to uh, be called an athletic director, you got to figure out the female side. Right. And so he helped me. Um, I started applying for a bunch of different universities, different positions. Um, and one after another was rejection after rejection after rejection. And the one that hurt the most, honestly, was a position at Baylor. Um, the guy who had hired me at Baylor University, 
Um, the director of athletics, when I went there, he since left because Baylor had a huge scandal years ago. He left Missouri to, to take over Baylor and he's still there. He's still their vice president and director of athletics. Um, he created a position for me to come down and then they rejected him and me. Actually, they, they were, said they weren't going to take his nominee who I was the nomination for it um, because I was a Latter-day Saint, not a Baptist. Right. And so um, so that was kind of rough. Right. Um, and then tack on to all that. Um, my youngest daughter, right? So my youngest daughter, Elena, when she was born, um, she was born and she wasn't, um, she wasn't breathing. Right. And so I'll be honest, I don't remember, uh, when she was born, I was there, but I actually passed out before any of it happened. Um, I missed the whole entire pregnancy. And then when I woke up, um, as many, many minutes later, my wife said she's gone. They, they took her, they're trying to get her to breathe. Um, but then we came home, she got, they got her to breathe. We came home. Well, four, she was four days old in the evening. We were sleeping and she was in the bassinet right next to us. And my wife uh, was woken up in the middle of the night by someone telling her, look at your daughter. And uh, my wife woke up, turned the light on and Alina was blue. Right. And so my wife woke me up. And uh, so I grabbed her real quick and I tried CPR. Um, luckily, they teach you that when you're having kids, CPR on an adult and CPR uh, on a kid is completely different. And so I was trying CPR on her. It wasn't working. So we rushed her to the ER, we threw, we got in the truck, rushed to the ER. Um, the huge blessing is they were able to get her breathing again. Um, and, and she's alive, right? But it was, it was pretty, pretty worrisome. Um, that same fall, uh, we got a chance to go to Minnesota, right? And so finally, after all those rejections and after all those, what we thought were setbacks, uh, we got a position to, to move to the University of Minnesota and, and be, start basically be their director of operations. Um, once again, started getting really blessed. Right. And so in terms of my career, I had the chance in our first year there as a staff, we went to the World Series. Um, we beat some pretty good, you know, you know, teams to get there, um, had some pretty good success. What I thought was a huge blessing in terms of my career, actually the biggest blessing of living there um, was being close to the Mayo Clinic. Right. And so Rochester, New York has the Mayo Clinic. We were just over an hour away. And so we were able to go there. And for my son, it was a huge it was a huge blessing. Because when we lived in Missouri, all of his lab work, all of everything that he had done to him was getting sent to the Mayo Clinic anyway, because his disease is so rare, especially for kids, that they didn't really have any experience with it. And so God led us there to where we could get that, you know, the help that we needed. And then after 10 years of working in college athletics, it got pretty exhausting. It got exhausting being away from my family. So if you look at the map, the, the blue states are the states that I've lived in. And the yellow states are basically where my second homes. When you work in Division One college athletics, you live out of airplanes and hotels on a constant basis. And when you have four kids, it's extremely hard to raise for my wife to raise the kids on her own. Um, and so, you know, again, exhausted from a family standpoint, my wife being by herself all the time. And then we had some un unfortunate deaths in our family here in York. Um, we decided, you know, what's most important as a parent? It's raising your kids. Right. And you only have one childhood. And if you think about your life, hopefully you know, your childhood, you had a really good childhood and the childhood is such a short period of time, but it's what really can make or break you for the rest of your life. And so I felt as a parent, I was failing my kids because I wasn't giving them the chance to have an amazing childhood, being around family, being around friends and me being home all the time. And so we started praying to God and said, you know, we're going to make a change. We're going to completely, you know, jump ship from what we're doing. What, what do you want us to do? Right. Um, and that's what led us here to, to where we are now. And so we purchased our business um, like said, October 1st of 2021. It was a blessing for us and a blessing for the couple who kind of had it as a hobby. They were looking to get out of it and we were looking to get into something. I'll be honest, I used to eat popcorn, you know, not like I wasn't like a popcorn fiend, right? I didn't eat it every single day. Um, but I, I do, I still, obviously I enjoy popcorn, but it's not like I had a, a passion for popcorn. I had a passion for helping people and blessing people and trying to share the light of Christ and share with people that, you know, you can do hard things, you can get through hard things. And, you know, God led us here. And so we, um, you can sign it. It's a phase, right? We're, we're, we're eventually going to get to the point where we are extremely pleased with our brand, with our, you know, who we are, what we're trying to accomplish, but it, it takes time. Right. And so my wife and I started, it was just my wife and I, um, now we have nine employees. If uh, we have a little location in front of target in West York, um, there's a little strip mall there with a famous hot wiener and, and we're right next to famous hot wiener. Um, back in March, we uh, purchased a building over in Columbia, right, just on the other side of the river. It's kind of more than um, it's gonna about triple the amount of space just on the first floor alone in this building that we purchased for our production. And so 
what we do now is we have a retail store, but we actually do a lot more. We do corporate orders. We do fundraisers. Uh, we do all kinds of vendor events. That's actually how I became a Rotarian. I became a Rotarian was uh, an event last year at the Rev Stadium for the York North Rotary Club was their fundraiser. I was there as a vendor. And then their their president last year was Ricardo. And Ricardo, you know, kind of like cornered me. And now I'm here. Um, and I want to change it for anything. Right. And so so um, this is um, that's our website. And and like our, our number one thing is so my number one thing as a business owner in, in life in general is just to bless people. Right. And blessing people looks different for everybody's situation, everybody's you know way of life. For our staff, we have some staff who are full time. We have staff who are part time. We have staff who are working for us because they're going through a divorce, right? And they need a little bit of extra cash to help out. We have staff who are teachers, and they just want some fun money on the side. We have staff who are full time. This is their this is their livelihood. Um, but then also from our our customers. Hopefully, if you come into our business, you're going to get greeted a certain way. You're going to get treated a certain way. Right. And our hope is that with every interaction that somebody has with Popcorn Loft, whether it's in our store, whether it's online, whether it's at events, and then eventually we've already started talking to Carnes and Giant and different grocery stores, getting our product out into more grocery stores. Even if you never actually talk to us by looking at our packaging, coming to our website, hopefully we can uplift you and we can inspire you. Right. Um, and so if you can, can you pull out the website then? So our website, we, um, so our website is thepopcornloft.com. As you can see, we have some different things on top. So we do, like, so we do corporate gifting, which is a huge part of our business this time of year, uh, because of the amount of businesses who want to do things, you know, for their employees or for their clients. And so you can kind of go here and you can see some of the business that we've already done stuff with since we've, you know, started two years ago. And then, Dan, if you want to scroll down quite a bit, we have, you know, we have sample boxes. We do a lot of Christmas tins, um, and so. My, so my, my presentation isn't really about popcorn. Honestly, it's not about my business, right? This is the byproduct of it. The blessing for us is God's given us a chance to help people and bless people. And I want you to know like you're going to go through hard things in life and you probably can think of it going to your memory of hard things that you've had to go through. Right. Um, but I know for a, like, without a shadow of a doubt, like, you know, I, I truly believe like God's not going to put more on our plate than we can handle. If we try our best, and I believe if you if we work as if everything in life depends on us, and if we pray as if everything depends on God, that those two paths will cross, right? And when they cross, great things can happen. So um, I did. Like, there are some samples on the table of just some of our kettle corn. So feel free to take the samples. Up here, we do have some pamphlets. We've got some different brochures that you can feel free to grab. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. Um, but I do like I, I thank you guys for the chance to come out. I thank Aaron for letting me come. Um, because I've, this is now my fifth or sixth time I've had a chance to go to different Rotary clubs in the last two months. Um, I'm a huge advocate in the short year I've been with Rotary. I think it's an amazing organization with an amazing, amazing people. And I think that's a very special place to be and a special people to be a part of, you know? So, um, but yeah, just to, to finish off, like I said, this is the quote that I read earlier from Dieter Uchtdorf. And it says, it is your reaction to adversity, not the adversity itself that determines how your life story will develop. So um any questions is it time for questions then so thank you we're good for you Great story. Thank you. Thank you for coming and share with us. Mm. Once you got into the popcorn business, how long did it take? And I'm sure it took a while and a lot of hard work to get to the point where you were at a critical mass of customers and production to be cash flow positive and to feel like this is working. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I still stress about it daily. <laughs> Honestly, like <laughs> I mean, it's not going to go away. So, um, I would say, uh, so one of the blessings is, is we, so we did take out a little loan to purchase our business. Um, we paid our loan off in the first year. Um, we haven't owed anybody anything since then. Right. So it was actually February. It was February of this past year. Um, because I'm a, I also, I, I, I try to live life. Like don't people want to take on loans all the time, right? You dig yourself a hole. The further that hole goes down, the longer it's going to take to come back out. Right. And so I would say it took us about a year. Um, to, to, you know, be in the black, 
Uh, and luckily we start on the black, but it's sometimes it's very thin and you're stressing about it, but I would say about a year's time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So Cody, what is your vision for the popcorn loft in five years and given your track record mm -hmm. of failure, essentially, yeah. how do you budget failure into that five-year plan? And I, and I say that, yeah. Oh, yeah. you know, in context. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I mean, we fail daily. Honestly, we fail every single day. Every single day I fail. Unfortunately, I had to let a lady go last night, uh, one of our employees, because of some unfortunate circumstances. Like, obviously, I didn't do the vetting process correctly, right? I thought I did. I mean, I failed last night, you know? And so um, I would say in five years' time, honest to goodness truth, our goal is within five years' time, that we're in at least 20 to 25 states, right, is our goal. Um, I don't want a lot of retail stores, quite frankly. We don't, because well, the more retail stores you have, the more overhead you have, and the harder it is. Gourmet popcorn is not as simply just putting it in the microwave and pushing a button, right? There's a lot of ways to screw it up. Um, and so there's a lot of, there's a lot of things that go into our recipes. Um, and quite frankly, the more hands that are involved in it, the more chances there are to screw it. And so, um, in five years time, I like to have, I just bought, we bought a building in Columbia. And so our goal is in two years time to outgrow that, right? We'll keep that as an experience to have people go, um, go to, but in five years time, we want to have, you know, two or three locations within a factory here in York. We want to build our own factory. Um, and so, because my thought is this, is to me, it's not about the money, right? It's about the impact. And I get the more money you have, the more impact you can have on people, the more you can bless people. And so if I could be in 20 to 25 different states, um, we already have connections because of my previous job in college athletics. A lot of our popcorn is named after different universities. So we're going down the process to get licensing done. We can, the names we have, we can use, but eventually we're going to put logos on our packaging. I want to like, we have a Nittany whiteout, right? It's a white chocolate pretzel popcorn. I have a goal to, when you, I'm not, I'm, and I'm not a Michigan or Penn state fan. I know a lot of people are right, but I'm, I'm indifferent, whether it's Ohio state, Penn state, Michigan state, like, the more the more stadiums we can get into, right? The more suites and boxes we can get into, the more people who get our product, the more that they go to the grocery store and they pick up our product. On our packaging, I was telling Dave this earlier. One of the things that we're going to do with our packaging once we go all pre-printed, um, all of our packaging is going to have a picture of the Savior on the back with a quote or a scripture. Because my hope is this: when somebody, like I said, when somebody grabs our popcorn, hopefully they think this is amazing popcorn and we love it. But more so, they can think. I can do hard things, right? And with the right support group around me, I can get through hard things. Um, and so, so I would say within five years time, hopefully we did a, we, we were just short of a half million dollars in sales our first year. Um, and so I'm hoping to get, you know, in five years time, being a couple million in sales um, in a lot of different places. So. Here's an easy one. What are the most popular flavors? Yeah. So different categories. So hands down, our quack attack is our, our quack attack is named after the university of Oregon. It's our extra butter, right? It's a bright yellow. Um, that's our number one seller. And which is a pain right now because our, our supplier uh, has been out for like three weeks. of, And so we don't have it right now, which is a huge bummer. Um, but then, so that our dark chocolate sea salt well, from a chocolate standpoint is a huge seller. And then actually our Buckeye blitz, which is a Hershey's peanut butter cup popcorn um, that we make. And then our, our caramel. Yeah. Thank you for that inspiring talk. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. yeah. Um, online sales. Are, mm -hmm. are you, instead of expanding in retail yep. online and is there growth in, in that and the competition? Yeah. So I, luckily we don't really have much competition right now. At some point we will, right. A direct competitor right now. There's somebody up in Carlisle who does a little bit out of his house. And then there's Emma's popcorn which is in new Holland. They have like the Amish market over there. Um, they're somewhat of a competitor outside. Then we don't really have much competitors online sales. We get really busy between now and Christmas. We'll average on a monthly basis throughout the year. We'll probably do 10 or 15 you know, boxes a month. Um, and we ship all over the country, but between now and Christmas, if it's like last year, it gets to the point where we're like the UPS truck will just back up to our store because we have so many online sales that instead of us taking it to them, they'll come get it from us. Um, but I definitely want to, I want to increase that side for sure. But in our growth, I'm trying to do as organically as possible because I don't want to stretch myself too thin and, and screw it up. Right. Popcorn junkie. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> question. You, today you used the phrase kettle corn. Mm -hmm. um, 
I, is that a is that a brand or is that it's a flavor a process? Yeah, so kettle is a flavor. So what, like if you go to a Hershey Park, you go to the fairs like that. Most times that's kettle corn. Kettle corn is salt, sugar, seed, and oil. That's it, right? And so kettle is the flavor, um, not really like a kind of way you do it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Over here. Thank you, Cody. I never knew there was so much about popcorn. Yeah. I, I'm always curious about the snack food industry and shipping air and preserving products in air. Uh, it To me, you say you want to be in 25 states. I'm thinking, yeah. how do you ship quality product to 25 states? You're shipping something that doesn't weigh anything, yeah. but it's volume. And how do you keep it fresh? Yeah, so you, you suck the air out of it. Right. So you'll find like all your bags of chips, right? You open up the bag. What happens? It's half empty. Why is it half empty? Because that air in there is a gas air to help preserve the popcorn. We do the reserve, like the reverse of it. We fill our bags complete. So if you're ever doing a fundraiser with us, if you ever had our popcorn as a fundraiser, you come into our store and just get it that way. What we do is we jam pack it to the very top. We throw an oxygen pack in it and we suck the air out of it. Right. So that way you're not buying air, you're buying product. Right. Um, so that's how we preserve it. Um, and then secondly, actually popcorn is not light. <laughs> it depends like, like cheese and butter. Okay. It's light. When you get into the caramels and the chocolates, like I actually have two boxes going down to new Orleans next week for explore York. Okay. Explore York. They're going down there for a, a tourism convention. Um, and so we're shipping down popcorn for them. It's almost a hundred pounds of caramel corn, right? So you have two 50 pound boxes, right? So, um, but yeah, so we preserve it by taking the air out of it. Um, and then, uh, also our packaging, Right now, we when we do fundraisers and events and stuff, we use a five millimeter thick bag, which is really thick. When we go to our pre-printed packaging, um, that pre-print on it will also help preserve it. Hmm. Sorry, just a technical question. Yeah. I, I thought the potato chip companies use nitrogen. Well, it's, it's, yeah, so they, they pump it in there. Okay, they so do you use nitrogen in, in your bags? Nope. No, we take we we suck. So, so nitrogen preserves the. The freshness of the mm -hmm. of the product. Yeah. So okay. there's there's two options. You can either you can fill it, suck the air out of it, or you can you can pump it, you know, like so with nitrogen gas. Um, I'm a firm believer you're not, I'm not if you're using if you're willing to take your hard earned money, right, to buy our product, I want you to buy our product. I don't want you to buy air. Right. Like I said, I get why they do it, right? When you're mass producing to that level, at for them it's about the dollar, right? Thank you so much for your presentation. Mm -hmm. um, my question is, you were talking about stepping into the popcorn industry to become more family focused. With starting a business, I know that there's a lot of time involved in uh -huh. that. What does that look like for you being a dad to yeah. your family, and your kids? So I'm, I'm averaging about 70 hours a week right now. Um, but whenever I do events, my kids will... A lot of times my kids will go with me, right? My wife will go with me. My wife, I, Aaron, she was supposed to be here today, but she's actually in the store helping out for an order that we just came came through on Monday. Um, so there's a little bit unbalanced, but sometimes you have to have unbalanced to gain balance, right? With my previous career, I was never home, but I was never even in the state, right? And when I was in the state, I was living at the field, right? Here, you know, I can, my kids, my, my 10 year old, my 10 year old can run our trailers, no problem. You come in the store, he runs the register, he takes care of you. Um, and we're training. I mean, I got four kids. I look at it like four. I'm, I'm not a farmer. I wish I had more kids, though. Right. I, I mean, <laughs> if I would have had more kids, I'd be even better set. Um, but uh, but yeah, so there's definitely an unbounce. Like we're not open on Sundays. Right. Because also I, I was trying to teach my kids the importance of going to church. Right. And, and to serving. And I'm like, how can I do that if I'm not even doing it myself? Right. And so now there is unbalance. I'm, I am averaging about 70 hours a week. Um, I have a phenomenal wife who helps me out. Um, but I think if you own your own business, if you're not willing to work and work and work and work, it will not, it won't succeed. Yeah. What are doing? I guess mean, so they're doing all right. Like I said, so uh, my son who's 10, um, he gets uh, treatments and procedures every other week that we can now administer at home. Um, and he gets seen. Now we go to CHOP, right? So the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, he gets seen down there and 
Um, so we go down there periodically, but extremely blessed. I mean, if your kids are going to go through hard times, like, and there's a list of like sicknesses that are uncurable. I mean, at least we got one that wasn't terminal. Right. And so then my youngest daughter, who's five, she's doing, she's doing extremely well in terms of that. She is the hardest kid we've ever had. Right. And so, um, we're, we're learning how to, to manage her personality. Um, but yeah, but they're, they're doing all right. Okay. Two part question. Yeah. Where do you get your corn from? And do you use different types of corn for different products? Yeah. So we use the same corn. Uh, we use a mushroom corn. Uh, we get it out from a company out of Allentown. We actually just this last week, we tried to use a company out of Mountain Joy um, called Reese Popcorn. It didn't go well. Um, we tried their seeds in different kinds. And so we use the same corn, um, but depending on what the outcome is going to be, we'll determine at what temperature and what oil we use, right? So different temperatures, it'll blow up bigger, it'll blow up smaller. Um, so it's all mushroom style corn, but then the process of how we, of how we cook it uh, will be different on depending on what we want it to become. Outstanding, Cody. And I got to tell you, it's not often that I hear a story where somebody shares a series of a service, blessings, and success while bookmarking it with failures. And, you know, talking about failure takes a lot of courage. But listening to your story gives us a clear message that even though we will make mistakes and fail, and we will make mistakes and fail, everything's going to be okay. That's the blessing. And I think everyone needs to hear that about journeys like yours to help give us the courage to try, to work hard, serve, and succeed. Cody, thank you for sharing that story, serving your community, and being an outstanding true Rotarian. Rotarians, let's thank our speaker again. All right. In honor of his presentation, Cody has signed the book plate in the book called The World Needs More Purple Schools by Kristen Bell. And this will be donated to the Davies Elementary School in the city of York, along with the bookmark, Yo, by the students from Creative York. Now, remember, take the popcorn with you, because if you don't, we're going to eat it next week. And if you thought that was a great program and that was a great program, wait till you hear what we got going on next week because it's our annual Veterans Day meeting and our speaker will be a York native, Sandra Kearse Stockton. Sandra served in the U.S. Army as a nurse for 30 years and retired as a lieutenant colonel. Sandra has been married to Aaron Stockton for 50 years and he is also a 20-year retired veteran. In May of 2023, she was the recipient of the Four Chaplains Legion of Honor Award in York. Sandra is also the author of the trilogy 480 Cador Street, Surviving Unpredictability, Trials and Tribulations and Endurance, similar to what we heard about today. Her story is one of perseverance and success against difficult backdrops of child abuse, teenage motherhood, gun violence, that, by the way, took the life of her husband and then later her own son. So that's not a great way to end it, but I will say this. Thank you for coming today. Have an amazing Rotarian week. <laughs>